All sides committed terrible things, and the UN troops were witness to those things. There were explosions and you hear people dying. It was war, it was obvious it was war. Brutality of that place was overwhelming. We haven't had a discussion in Canada what Bosnia was all about. So they came with the uh, idea of putting us in a camp, like concentration camp. There are people who don't want healing and reconciliation. They want revenge. They didn't want us there. They want the freedom to kill one another. We are still blaming each other. No, it's your fault. No, 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 it's your fault. It's your fault. The precious land for which they were spilling blood will be empty or poor. Everyone loses. Beautiful place. Just blown all apart. When I stay in the city, when all my friends fled, it doesn't matter where they went, it doesn't matter what side, I hated them. Same time when you go away, you want to go back home. Still want to go back home. I just don't know where it's at anymore. Two decades after the war in the former Yugoslavia, there is peace in the region. But the scars of the war are everywhere. At least 130,000 people died in the chaos, including 23 Canadians who lost their lives trying to bring peace to the region. Some of the echoes of conflict are visible, graves and rubble. Others cannot be seen, wounds of the spirit. For the Canadian soldiers that serve there, and the refugees that found shelter in Canada, these wounds now stretch across place and time, but they all cross paths in the former Yugoslavia and a forgotten war that was a watershed moment in Canadian military history. For the people of Yugoslavia, the war did what all wars do. It brought danger, destruction, and death. The former Yugoslavia was made up of six republics. Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, with Yugoslavia's capital, Belgrade, Montenegro, and Macedonia. Following World War II, the country enjoyed decades of peace under the leadership and ideology of President Josip Broz Tito. His leadership was unique among the communists in encouraging a decentralized government. With greater regional and local independence, Tito was successful in easing tensions between the three main ethnic groups, Croats, Serbs, and Bosniaks, until his death in 1980. There is so much to say. He was, he was loved. When he died, people cried. He helped Yugoslavia become what it had been. Religion is the biggest difference between the three main ethnic groups. Croats are Roman Catholic, Serbs are Orthodox Christian, and the Bosniaks are secular Muslims. But for many people, especially in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo, those differences meant nothing. Growing up in Sarajevo, we all went to the same school, we wore the same clothes, you know. Uh, we did have tons of uh, you know, uh, aspirations of life like anybody else, and we really did not uh, look different, or we didn't speak differently, or it was just same same people. My best friends were Bosniaks and Croats. We there there was no difference. We never considered who is who. We grew up in same neighborhoods. We went to same schools. Yugoslavia, after World War II, implemented this policy called Brotherhood and Unity, which was uh, actively taught in schools. We were taught that we were equal and brothers. Being Serb, being Croat, being Muslim, being, you know, didn't matter at all. Mila Mitrovic was born and raised in Vukovar, Croatia. He was a teacher before being forced to serve in his local militia. I thought that we are all brothers and we are all same, that, you know, that will never happen. 
In 1991, it did happen. Slovenia and Croatia, two embittered republics, declared their independence from Yugoslavia. The Yugoslav army, primarily controlled by Serbs, moved to occupy the area, starting the war in the former Yugoslavia. You are on your land, your house, your village, your town, your city. You spend all your life over there. And suddenly, somebody trying to take this from you. Everybody at the time, all my friends, I wouldn't say all, but 95% of them said, no, it's not nothing going to be here. Just, you know, it's going to be probably a little bit of um, uncertainty, maybe for a couple of weeks and everything will be fine. In March of 1992, Bosnia follows Slovenia and Croatia and declares their independence from Yugoslavia. Some people felt like that their national identity was endangered in Yugoslavia, that socialism suppressed nationalism and religion, and they felt endangered. Yugoslavia went from a cultural melting pot to a country in which old friends faced each other on the battlefield. Basically, you're engaging conversation, trying to discover who is on the other side. And then you start realizing, oh my God, I know you. Like, you know, we, we played soccer together or, you know, we've been in the same circle of friends for, for quite some time. And so like, this is unreal. With the conflict intensifying, the UN decides to send in peacekeepers, including Canadians. When it was told that we were going in for peacekeeping, I figured we would just be between the two sides, like, you know, Cyprus. Cyprus was actually peacekeeping, and you were there to make sure that one side didn't uh, do something to the other side. And if it did, you sorted it out at the lowest level and kept the peace. Vince Rigby grew up in New Waterford, Nova Scotia. He joined the Cape Breton Highlanders in 1981 and did peacekeeping tours in Bosnia and Cyprus. There was a lot of foot patrols in, in between the towns, Turkish and, and the Greek. And yeah, it wasn't bad, you know, it was, or go see the town, lots to do, people loved us, I had no problems, right? We get into Bosnia, we weren't ready. When you have a five-way civil war that you don't know who's doing good things, who's doing bad things, because they're not, none of them are. How do you keep the peace when there's no peace to keep? Stu Rogers was a farm boy from a small town in Ontario. He joined the army for adventure and to see the world. He was among the first Canadian peacekeepers deployed as part of UNPROFOR, the United Nations Protection Force. When he arrived in Yugoslavia, he was surprised to see such devastation. Pictures you see from, from World War II, when you had uh, blown up buildings and bullet holes through everything and all the destruction, it was like that. The drive in was really an eye opener to me of how brutal people could be. Like seeing pictures of the Second World War, nothing compares to like being right in a, you could almost feel the curtain of hatred. In April 1992, peacekeepers made their way into the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo, which was under siege. They discovered a city torn apart, which only eight years before hosted the world for the Winter Olympics. I remember seeing this beautiful, beautiful country where a decade later, neighbors are, are killing neighbors. And what happened to this country? You know, what, what happened? Where did it go? It was a very much a multicultural city because they embraced each other's cultures. You had Christian churches next door to mosques. To see a city that was so beautiful, just completely destroyed, and for really not, not, a, not a valid reason. Zoran Jakic, his wife Clea, and son Denny were living in Sarajevo when the siege began. All of a sudden, you know, I started feeling that some dosage of fear, I would say. And we kind of sitting in front of uh, the TV, and all of a sudden, light shuts out and like, completely like dark, nothing. You're just trying to survive every day, pretty much. You, 
you know, you try to, to help your family first. And that's kind of, you know, I think uh, any human being, you know, especially being father at the time, you know, trying to, uh, to, to provide food, to provide, you know, necessities. You see that you're hungry, you don't have enough food, and kid is starving. Not only did they lack fresh water, electricity, and food, they lived with constant daily bombings and a perpetual fear of snipers. You're learning how to live with it, but I would be lying if I said that, you know, I got used to it. Steve Dornan was serving in the Royal Canadian Air Force in Winnipeg when he was deployed to help with the airlift of humanitarian aid to Sarajevo two and a half years into the siege. The snipers and that have had years to uh, find the best locations, and so did the artillery, the Serb artillery that was uh, raining shells down on the city as well. So they pretty much had everything zeroed in. When you're moving down uh, Sniper Alley, which follows the, the old tramway down, you see you know, destruction everywhere. There isn't a building that's not damaged or destroyed all the way along. You're driving around bridges and, and uh, overpasses and that sort of thing that are literally blown apart. Or you're driving around craters uh, in your vehicle trying not to fall through the holes on the bridges that are, that are damaged. Um, there is no repair, there's no infrastructure, there's no nothing. It is a modern city with people that look just like you and me living in a hell. Zoran had to stay and serve in the army, but Clea and Denny Jakic miraculously found safe passage to leave siege-ridden Sarajevo, thanks to Zoran's American sister-in-law. She was knocking on the door, actually, to different American embassies around Europe, and uh, she was fortunate that uh, somebody finally wanted to, to hear her out. One day, just a UN transporter came, and basically they said, jump in, you're leaving. Everybody was trying leaving. I, I have friends from all three nations who were trying leaving. If somebody heard that there are tickets selling at the airport, everybody will be calling friends of all three nations and telling them there is possibility to fly. You're in this little piece of your world and all around you is chaos. And it's like, wow, what's, what's going on? What is our role here? Sometimes you can see dead bodies. You can see dogs eating those people, but the troops are not coming and not doing anything. I had high hopes when the UN peacekeepers arrived in Sarajevo just before the war. I had hoped they can help stop the war. Sometimes it's hard when you live in a city that's uh, completely closed down and you look at the peacekeepers and you're trying to, to understand why they're not helping people. So as a peacekeeper, it's your primary duty to help. They had a tough job. This is all only what men say. I later learned that UN peacekeepers actually <laughs> did not have mission to, to help much. Strict rules of engagement, or ROEs, restricted peacekeepers from acting. Part of the problem with the rules of engagement are there's a lot of kind of gray areas. You had to uh, have direct evidence of having been fired at in order to shoot back, and that was as clear as they made it. And the only way we could figure that is somebody's going to have to get hit. The ROEs are repeated to you fairly often. And then when you're not hearing them, then you're reminding your buddy, well, okay, somebody's gotta get hit today. How about you take the hit? If you broke the rules. It was $1,000 a round. And uh, a private's pay was only a thousand, not even a thousand dollars, you know, every month. You have to get shot, literally shot, before you can shoot back because of self-defense at that time. My very first day, very first patrol, if a bullet goes close enough to your head, you hear the, um, the crack of the round because it's breaking the sound barrier. That's how close that round is. And I'm telling you, I, I, I hit the ground and I almost shit my pants. Like that's when reality set in that you are in a war zone. And it's unnatural. You know there's a threat, you see a threat, but you can't do anything. You just hope that it's not you. If you're being fired at, dash down, crawl, observe. That's what we're taught. And when you have to worry about stuff like that, it kind of takes away from the training that we were taught. We're there just to observe, we can't interfere. That was probably the hardest thing to have to deal with, is not be able to get involved and stop this. 